Good evening, everybody. Mr. Secretary, are we ready with minutes? Momentarily, please. Apologies for the delay. We had a minor technical problem to sort out. <laughs> We are recording, by the way. Mr. Chair, ready when you are. I'm sorry? Ready when you are. All right, for anybody that doesn't know me, my name is Mark Montoni. I've been in the Libertarian Party since 1980. Uh, I currently chair the LP Judicial Committee. Uh, we rotate our chairmanship uh, around the membership. I believe we have a four-month term or a six-month term. In any case, I'm going to open this up by giving each of our committee members a minute or two to introduce themselves and, if they like, to um, provide their understanding of our role in this decision. So let's start with uh, Stefan Kinsella. Hi, I'm Stefan Kinsella. Um, and uh, yeah, I see our role as is to uh, um, decide whether or not the contested issue is within the bylaws, not whether we agree with the, the action taken. All right, thank you, Stefan. Uh, let's go to Blay Tarnoff. Hi. Uh this is Blake Tarnoff. I uh, echo what Stephen said. We're uh, we're here to judge the bylaws, uh, not to uh, consider emotional arguments or uh, uh, or arguments of policy. We all have our ideas about what's a good idea or what's a bad idea, but I think uh, our role is a is a judicial one, meaning that the rules have been presented, have been duly passed by people who are empowered to pass them, and it's our job to determine how the rules uh, are impact the case, and that's it. Thank you, Blay. Uh, Ken, uh, introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you think our role is. Hey, Mr. Chair, thank you for the time. My name is Ken Krawchuk. I've been a libertarian since 1993. I've run for governor several times. I'm planning to run again. I was also chaired the Pennsylvania Judicial Committee for many years. I've been on it, I don't know, I've lost count, 10, 15, 20 times. And as for what we're doing here tonight, as many of you know, I like to call myself the libertarian Lorax because I speak for the rules. And that's what I'm here to hear, to, here to hear tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, let's go to Mike Seebeck. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, life, life member, three-time candidate, 20-plus year member, uh, multiple state parties, national committees. Again, the, uh, to echo what Mr. Krawchuk said, our job is to figure out by the rules and go from there. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to Rob Latham. Hi, good afternoon or evening, everybody. Rob Latham from Utah, also lifetime member, uh, several time member of this judicial committee and also the bylaws and rules committee. And um, maybe not only echoing what others on our committee have said, but also just wanted to express our appreciation um, for the materials that have been sent to us. That's helped uh, inform us, I think, on the the matter at hand and just um even though there are three lawyers on this committee, uh, I, I do want to disabuse people of the notion that this is uh, like a an official court. Um, even though we're calling this a formal hearing, it is somewhat of a informal process. And you know, I I, I again do see our job as uh, trying to carry out our duty under Article Eight of our party bylaws, and of course we have rules on how we go about doing that, um, and, and that. Because of the materials we received, which I think, again, were very helpful, that has informed, I think, our approach in the email that Mr. Montoni sent out um, on on how to approach this this hearing and, and, and what would be most helpful to us in making a dispute. And, you know, in parties, you have many people with different points of view. 
and we have a dispute resolution process. This is one of those dispute resolution processes. Um, and, and so that's what we're here to do is uh, we have at least two members with different ideas on, on how a party should handle a matter. And they've uh, sent it to us to perhaps, perhaps uh, resolve that dispute. So thanks again. Thank you, Rob. Uh, who are we missing? Is Mr. Um, Stratton among us? I haven't seen him in the list, on the participants list. And neither do I. Uh, do we have any other members of the committee that haven't spoken yet? I believe we covered everybody else. Okay. All right. The next thing I'm going to do, it's going to take another couple of minutes. I would like to introduce the presenters for each side. Um, uh, then I know of the submitter of the petition, Karen Ann Harlos is here. I assume she's going to be the presenter for her side. And I do not yet know who the presenter will be for the uh, respondent side. Angela is indicating that's her. So let's go to... Uh, Mr. Chair. One moment, Ms. Harlos. We're going to ask Angela to introduce herself first and just uh, give us uh, who you are and your position and uh, just give us the, like we did, 30 seconds or so of uh, what you think this process is about. My name is Angela McArdle. I'm the chairman of the Libertarian National Committee, and uh, we're here to decide whether or not um, something is or isn't against the bylaws. That's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Ms. Harlos? Okay, and I didn't know if you wanted to let me to let you know at this time that I'm splitting my time. Um, but my name is Karen Ann Harlos, a lifetime member of the party, been a member for 10 years, been involved in uh, defending various bylaws issues. And this is, of course, a bylaws issue. It's not an emotional issue, even though many of us may feel emotionally about it, though I don't think emotions can be uh, completely removed when when you have a party that has a line in its statement of principles that we uh oppose the cult of the omnipotent state, which is quite an, an emotional statement. So libertarians are emotional creatures, but this is obviously against the bylaws. I mean, sorry, about the bylaws. Don't want to presume my conclusion, not necessarily about our emotions, but to pretend like we're robots also, I think would be um, completely unrealistic. So that's my background. But Mr. Chair, did you want to know just to get on deck um, potentially other speakers. I say potentially because I will, will be the first one. And I understand that JC can interrupt with questions, which may eat up all the time. So if there's remaining time, I do have other persons to call upon. Uh, why don't you give us two of them that may be in your line of um, proxies? Okay. Um, well, first of all, it will be me. Um, second of all, I plan on having Mr. Todd Hagopian speak. And if there is remaining time, very briefly, Richard Brown. Okay. Is Mr. Hagopian in this meeting yet? Yes, sir. All right. Please introduce yourself and tell us, um, give us basically the same thing that the members of the committee ha have done. Yeah. Todd Hagopian, former LNC treasurer. Here to support uh, Karen Ann's appeal. Thank you. And I believe you said the the other one was Richard Brown. If there's time, which I yes, please go ahead, Richard. Richard is still muted. Pardon me, I had to unmute. Thank you, uh, Richard Brown. I'm I've been the. Uh, National Party's Convention Libertarian since the 1996 uh, convention. I'm, I'm not expecting to have to speak, but I said I would be available, and I am available. All right. Thank you. The next order of business, or next item on the agenda, is to begin with the presentations. Um, let's see. We have, I, I believe I had the, the petitioner first on the agenda. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, somebody can correct me. Um, correct. Ms. 
Ms. Harlos, if you would like to begin, go ahead. Um, yeah, and I really would like to reserve most of my time for questions from the JC because I do think the written arguments were, were quite extensive and nearly everything I would say would be in the written arguments. I would like to draw the committee's attention though um, to the fact that I do think of, of not just a particular action that the repercussions of an action, whether or not those repercussions open the door to further bylaws violations is an order, again, not emotional arguments. The chair has said in an interview two days ago that if this um, issue with the RFK joint fundraising agreement was settled um, in the favor of the LNC, that they would be more than happy to enter into a joint fundraising agreement with the Trump campaign. So it would open it up, not just to the Trump campaign, it could be to any campaign, I suppose, including Kamala Harris. So I do think that's an issue, but I also think there's an issue um, in the way, and I, I, I'd like to read this out loud because this is the argument that was made in favor of the motion that was passed. Um, Mr. Kennedy's campaign is an independent campaign and it is not tied to a national political party. A joint fundraising committee is a special fundraising committee authorized by the FEC where an individual donor can donate the maximum amount that's allowable to a national political party, which I believe is $42,300. As an independent candidate, Mr. Kennedy is not associated with it, with a campaign. So he's maxed out for his donors basically at the individual contribution letter slash level. This would allow Kennedy supporters to donate to the candidate of their choice at a larger level in connection with the Libertarian Party. So we would basically have to set up a joint fundraising committee and a dedicated bank account, which would be just account with one of our banks and his supporters can donate there and they would basically get to borrow our Many contribution million. limits. So I really don't want to million. read any further than Many. that. I think that is sufficient. And I think someone's mic is open, Mr. Montoni. Um, this goes against our bylaws in multiple, multiple ways that I have outlined, I think, um, it, it, to the best of my ability um, underneath uh, in my initial appeal. But there, 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 there were some things that were said that I'd like to respond to. I never claimed that a that fundraising for the opposition is greater than nominating the candidate. What I said was that fundraising for the competition is certainly more than the mere words of an, of, um, an endorsement, which is explicitly uh, prohibited to the state affiliate party. It's, and it would be absolutely ridiculous for it to be allowed to the national party if it's prohibited to the state parties. But I would remind everyone that our bylaws give an interpretive grid. That interpretive grid is the statement of principles. And the statement of principles by the founders of this party uh, have been embedded into our bylaws kind of as a self-destruct mechanism that we cannot go against them. And uh, there is absolutely no question under the sun that Robert F. Kennedy wants a big, big state. This is not merely getting money for existing. If we wanted to do that, we could set up a really successful MLM where they really do get money for, for just existing. So I'd like to see if there's any questions. If not, I'd like to give it some time to Mr. Hagopian. So I'd entertain any questions from the Judicial Committee? Well, then, um, if there aren't any, I'd like Mr. Hagopian to have some time. And if there's Actually, any remaining time. Okay, thank you. thank you, Mr. Go ahead, Mike. I was, waiting just, I was actually waiting to see if someone's going to raise their hands, but it's okay. Um, all right. Um, a couple of things that have popped up in the along the way between the petition and the, resp petition and the respondent. Um, that I'd like to get addressed. Uh, first one is that um, respondents claiming that the appeal is procedurally defective because the appeal lists Ms. Harlow alone as the appellant, but then the and respondent then goes on to claim that the signatories to the appeal do not know what they're signing. So my qu first question is, did the signatories know what they were signing in terms of the appeal? Okay, this is, I've, I've been on the LNC a while. This is the way the Delaware appeal was signed. And it's funny, the same objection was not raised by the LNC for the Wisconsin appeal, which is um, the exact same way. What was signed by the um, signatories is that it violated certain bylaws. Those are the bylaws that I cited. And I cited the motion. Any Every signatory has had the opportunity because I 
mailed them personally to see the appeal. And as libertarians, we do believe that we can sign away our speaking rights to other people, which they have in fact done. And if there was any kind of procedural anomaly, anomaly that could easily be cured by the judicial committee taking all of those signed signatures as the actual original petition and my comment as an amicus. Either way, it procedurally passed muster and has for well over a decade in the Libertarian Party. Thank, Thank uh, you. Follow up. I have, a, I have some follow ups. Um, have any of the signatories since the since the appeal was written and filed and submitted, have they requested they be taken off of it? No. And I've emailed all of them. OK. Um, next one does. Do we know if the joint fundraising agreement has been vetted by legal counsel? That's a, a specifically one that's proficient in FEC rules. I cannot answer that. That would be a question for the chair. Let me okay. let me make uh, some, something clear here. Um, I have voluntarily recused myself from any executive sessions that have to do with the J JFC. So there could be conversations that I'm not aware of, would not be claiming that the LNC has hid any of those from me since I did recuse myself from them. I wish to stand in the seat of an average member in appealing this decision and do not want any information that the average member does not have. Okay, I, I have two more questions. They're pretty, pretty simple. Um, is do we have any evidence that the Oliver campaign is opposing this agreement? Yes, they told me. Okay, because it hasn't been produced for any documentation. Last question: um, You mentioned in, in your brief that there was uh, regarding full support to the official ticket that there are limits and there may be gray areas. Could you elaborate on that? I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Can you please repeat it? Sure. In your brief, you mention that full support of the official ticket, ha uh, that there are obviously limits and there may be gray areas. And could you oh, elaborate okay. on what those gray areas are? Okay, let's say a, a multi-billionaire said if the national secretary would commit ritual suicide um, on national TV, if we're getting into Black Mirror territory, that I would make sure that my hundreds of thousands of cult followers would give $40,000 each. I think that is pretty obvious. Um, that 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 would not be full support. It would be full support within our capabilities under the bylaws that are within reason. I think it is like that, whether it's apocryphal or not, I think it's illustrative of that Supreme Court judge who said, you know, I might not be able to define pornography exactly, but I certainly know it when I see it. This is a bylaws violation and I know it when I see it. <laughs> Thank you. Any other members of the Judicial Committee? Yeah, Ken Krawchuk here. I'd like to jump in with a couple of questions. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, Ms. Harlos, in your original pleading, it says the bylaws alleged to be violated, and you list Articles 2, 3.1, 14.1, 14.3, and 14.4. Can you be more specific? I read Article 2, and that just says the purpose of the party to do all sorts of good things. Yes. Which, which part of Article 2 was violated and how? I think I went through um, each of them. Give me one second because I am going um, through our, let me just pull up the bylaws. So, cause you know, reading a document um, is, is boring. You, 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 all, you, you, you all can certainly um, uh, uh, do that yourself. So, so let me, um, I'm going to our webpage right now. I'm sorry, I didn't have this in front of me the first time. So article two talks about the purpose of the party, which, you know, is why um, we exist. Oh my God, our website is slow today. So 2.1, uh, excuse me, a uh, 2.1 functioning as a libertarian political entity, separate and distinct from all other political parties and movements. Um, RFK Jr. has described himself as a movement. They are this movement, this wave of being against the, the uniparty, of being this, this independent, new, fresh voice. We are not operating separate if we're in a joint agreement with them. Joint is like kind of the opposite of separate. Um, electing libertarians to public office. Well, in the statement of the chair to um, adopt this motion, she said it was so that his supporters could borrow our contribution limits. That's not electing libertarians. That's helping 
to elect somebody else. And he certainly does not want to move public policy in general in a libertarian direction. He wants to start a massive national daycare and raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, affiliate parties also, um, that one could be a little vaguer, but, but however, so promoting their growth and activities, it does not promote the growth of our affiliate parties to um, support candidates that aren't libertarian candidates, nominating candidates for president and vice president and supporting um, them for political office. This doesn't do this. It, it openly supports RFK for political office. And five, entering into public information activities. What kind of public information is there in confusing the libertarian brand with someone that wants, again, to raise the minimum wage, create a massive welfare state, has talked about reparations, and I have detailed in my multiple briefs the various anti-libertarian, not unlibertarian, anti-libertarian positions that he holds. Okay, thank you. I was expecting a shorter answer, but that's okay. Can about... you know I'm long-winded? <laughs> Go for it, Carl. Uh, 3.1, statement okay. of principles? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, he's a big statist. And the, the statement of principle says all other political parties other than our own believe that government should have the right to interfere into the voluntary contractual relations between individuals and seize the fruits of their labor without their consent. This Kennedy wants to do exactly that. He has um, openly advocated for the violation of the statement of principles. I would think if he was nominated at convention, which he was not, he got 2.07% of the vote, that the National Committee would be completely within its bounds to void his nomination simply on that grounds. Okay, thank you. 14.1. Uh, 14.1 14. Was... 14. 14 talks about full, uh, I'm, I'm scrolling down, says, um, mm -hmm. says that nominations right. can only be had at a convention. While this is not technically a nomination, it is de facto an endorsement, which is a, a lesser form, so, you know, of when something greater is prohibited, that which is lesser is um, also accepted. Okay. Uh, right there, 14.3. 14.3 um, talks about how we can withdraw support. There is a way to withdraw support from our candidate, and this is how you do it. You do it through a vote of the LNC. We haven't violated that, have we? Yeah, because I do believe we are supporting another candidate without going through. You know, there's constructive disaffiliation where we treat another leadership of an affiliate that we haven't disaffiliated. Uh, we, we treat different people as the leadership. This is a constructive denomination of our candidate by supporting the direct competition. Thank you. And go for the full strike here. 14.4. Um, and 14.4 says we shall respect the vote of the delegates at the nominating convention. We are certainly not respecting them by supporting fundraising for a candidate that was eliminated in the first round of voting with only 19 votes of the delegates. Right. And I, I would like to mention that I, I, I think the JC can consider all arguments. It actually says that in the um in the rules, um, we are required to follow federal laws. I don't know if we'll get to Mr. Hagopian, but I have become convinced that this does violate the FDC. It's been very, very squirrely the way it was. And Article 9, Section 5 also says that you can't take a loan of over $2,000 without a two-thirds vote of the LNC. If we are violating the laws here, we might be owing money to people. Now, again, that is a more indirect argument, but it certainly is an implication. Okay. Thank you for the answers. It's just what I was looking for. Um, thank you, thank, thank you, you Lorax. Hey. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead, Stefan. I've got my hand up. I don't know. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead first. I didn't see that. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you. And, and just I'll, I'll make the comments since we're talking about the um, the FEC. And again, this is hopefully not to invite such action, but I, I'm aware that the FEC is one of the losingest federal agencies mm -hmm. um, th that we have in the U.S. So um, that they might take action uh, doesn't impress me too terribly much. But I, I guess my question, um, Madam Secretary, is 
would you acknowledge that there is a distinction in terms of the restriction on endorsements from Article 5.4 of the bylaws, that there is a distinction between the LNC as a national organization and a state affiliate, again, with respect to uh, how Article 5.4 limits uh, endorsements? Um, yes, certainly. Um, but I did get into that in my in, into my brief. It, it would make zero sense for a lower organization to be prohibited from something that violates the statement of principles. Because remember, that is the second sentence of that um, of that bylaw. If the national party can do it with impunity. Well, then following up on that, though, I mean. I don't know necessarily that the national organization is is higher or lower. It, it's it's just different, and therefore Article five point four treats it different. I mean, what would you say to that argument? Um, I would say actually we we are under Roberts, and if you look under um, Article five point two, where it talks about state level affiliates are chartered. Um, under parliamentary law, a chartered organization is a subordinate organization to a parent. Okay, but that still doesn't answer my question. I think I'll give you another shot here on on why 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 does Article five point four then treat the national organization, the LNC, the same as a state affiliate in terms of its restriction on endorsements? Time of five point four. You said five point three. Five Article five point four. Okay, five, I believe it's five point four. To, yep. to 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 make explicit that the child can't do it either. Okay, and and do you have a citation for parliamentary authority, or is just um I put that's it what you know in from my, your experience. Oh no, you put it in I, your brief. I, I did, and the one about uh, and I might have it by memory if I'm going um, correctly. Two point thirteen. I believe, um, and that might not be correct. It is, it is, and I could answer, I could give you citations afterwards, but it is in one of my briefs. I don't have it memorized. It's not 213, but it is in chapter two, and it's also in a footnote um, that I don't have memorized. Okay, great. Thanks for your answers. I'll yield to others. Um, I don't think right. I'm able to Anyone else? my hand. I don't know how to raise a hand. I can't. I don't see anything on my. Uh, I don't either. Look at the raise. look at the bottom of your screen. There's a little heart shaped um, monogram, I guess. And uh, if, if or you, mine, it says reactions. It's part of the reaction suite. And also, if you have an old Zoom, should, maybe you I need should. to update your Zoom. Ah, uh, raise hand. There we go. Raise hand. All right. Um, Blay, I know that you were. I know that you were waiting anyway. So go ahead. Uh, okay, let me lower my hand first. Um, so I guess the first question is: um, do You can, would you uh, concede that the uh, respondents uh, uh, bear will to the party? They're just making uh, a bad policy decision, or or do you do you think that there is? Uh, intent to harm the party somehow i don't think intent. Party. i'm not going to speak to intent because i don't think intent is part of the bylaws i think they're violating the bylaws whether they intend to or not well i i'm i'm not sure i agree with that i think uh i think intent uh could come into play in a well, number then, of uh, okay of Okay, then I'll then, then I'll speak to it slightly. Harm is such a a, a, a weird term. Um, I, I I would think it would take a pretty evil person to intend to harm, but I think through the the conversations that I've had with other LNC members, they certainly do not respect the structure of the party as it has existed for 50 years and do not believe that the bylaws are an impediment to them through fiat changing the structure of the party. So they do intend to fundamentally change the structure of the party. Whether or not that is harm is in the eye of the beholder. I think it's harm. Others may not. Thank you. Um, oh. Blade, did you have anything else? Yeah, I have, I have a, a couple of things. Um, it, uh, I, I'm not asking whether they're, uh, whether they're being harmful. Um, well, let me just take, you know, I see three 
substantive questions here. One is the, the what I call the public policy clause, Article 2.2, um, that says that the um, one of the stated purposes of the party is to move public party policy in a libertarian direction. Do you think that um, that this uh, agreement or, or the operation of this agreement uh, violates that? Do you think it moves public policy uh, in a contra-libertarian direction um, or is intended to move public policy in a contra-libertarian direction? Richard Sher, are we at time? All right, we are at time. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to the respondent side, Angela. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. If it's all right with with you all, I'll speak for a couple of minutes. Cede to Jonathan Jacobs for just a minute or two, and then to turn it back to you for questions. Um, we're in a difficult year. The ballot is crowded with uh, the addition of two independent presidential candidates. It's unfortunately sucked up a good chunk of the protest vote and donor money along with it. And our presidential candidate, and I mean no disrespect when I say this, is controversial. He's taken petition uh, positions on particular issues that some of our members find to be a bridge too far. And we at the national level are struggling to get people connected with his campaign because of it. We're struggling to get the campaign the support it needs. I say we because it's something that I work on every day in spite of some of these controversies. And in spite of the accusations leveled against me, I'm in daily contact with the campaign working with them on getting them onto the ballot, uh, trying to find them volunteers and donors, passing them interview invitations, getting them on stage at Freedom Fest, passing them policy positions and collaborating with their social media team. They have support from us. And while some people may not like the tongue in cheek way I've done it, I have given them my full support. They are underfunded and I am trying to give them additional campaign support with this joint fundraising committee. The party also is not in a great place financially. The, the joint fundraising committee is going to save our financial situation. I think we have about two months worth of left, two months worth of cash on hand left to support our operating expenses. And I have a staff that's working very hard and some LNC members who are working very hard with me to generate fundraising outside of the JFC. But that is what's going to put us across the finish line and help us through the rest of the year and truly support our presidential candidate. What is full support? It's not particularly defined, and apparently people have different ideas of what it means. But I know that I'm giving my full support, and I'm the one in charge of this organization. I could also cut the budget for various things. I could lay people off. I could dump all of the remaining assets into the party. But I don't think that's what anyone means when they say full support. You know, the, the Ronar citation that's been thrown around says a prohibition or limitation prohibits everything greater than what is prohibited or that goes beyond the limitation, but it permits what is less than the limitation. And it also permits things of the same class that are not mentioned in the prohibition or limitation and that are not evidently improper. We are engaging in joint fundraising and that is less than an endorsement. And we have affirmed our candidates twice publicly now once in an amendment to an email motion, and now we have a different email motion that I think is gonna pass. Um, there's no bylaw that prohibits fundraising coalitions. Full support means to give them support, which we have done and which we intend to continue doing. Full support does not mean financial suicide. That would be the opposite of support. Uh, we will continue to be separate and distinct. We have our own candidate and our own party we have not and we will not endorse anyone else for president. We continue to engage in issue coalition work, sign on to ballot access lawsuits with other parties and engage in other activities that lend support back to us, to our party and our candidates. Um, I'd like to give uh, Jonathan Jacobs just a moment to address anything that he thinks I missed. And I'll certainly answer FEC questions to the best of my ability. Uh, I didn't see that much. Thank you all for permitting me to speak. Um, I would uh, just note here that uh, in the filing, I have said as well that uh, this is a question of bylaws, and this is not a this is not a violation of bylaws. That 
I think is the key. The bylaws, as uh, Chair McArdle noted, uh, are such that, uh, covered by Robert, that a prohibition or a limitation prohibits everything greater than what is prohibited or goes beyond that limitation. But it permits what is less than that limitation. And um, also permits things of the same class that are not mentioned in the prohibition or limitation and that are not ev evidently improper. This isn't aiding the can aiding a candidate helps. It helps your candidate. You have reaffirmed in a motion which was legitimately adopted that uh, Mr. Oliver and Mr. Termat are the president and vice president. In fact, if this were a if for some reason they were not, the joint fundraising agreement would not work. It because it says that it is dependent upon they being the candidates. This is not an endorsement. This is not a nomination. This is the same thing as is being done in, I believe, the state of New York, where they are engaged in a suit against the state for ballot access with the same uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, that's Jonathan, basically all yeah, that I have. Jonathan, I was, I'm going to interrupt you for a second for a procedural matter. Um, there is a, uh, Mike, if you would stop the clock for the moment, there is one user listed as Zoom user. We are going to use real names in this chat or in this meeting. Uh, Zoom user, whoever you are, please change your name to your actual name. And if you have, uh, if there's anybody else who is only using a first name or a pen name, please change your name to your full name. All right, um, Mike, you can start the clock again. Jonathan, were you done? Uh, just two points that I should make. First of all, I have submitted a um, amicus brief to you. Uh, I want to be clear. I wrote that myself without any input from anybody on the LNC and without their knowledge. This is my original work. Uh, Ms. McCardle knew about it when I sent her a copy. Um, that would be the, that would basically be what I am, what I did want to say. Oh, and, uh, as well, I found out that I would be doing the presentation about a half an hour ago. So after the hearing started, um, so I will answer any questions if somebody has. Them. Um, Mr. Tar Mr. Tarnoff, I think, but, uh, Mr. Uh, Montoni, would you recognize these? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, Rob or Blay, which one of you was first? Blay. I right. saw Blay uh, first actually, and actually, Stefan second. Oh, oh, hold on. <laughs> Stefan was holding his uh, hand up at the end of the petitioner's session. Uh, Stefan, was your question direct to be directed at the petitioner or was it more in general? Oh, I'm holding my question for uh, the petitioner for later, but uh, I have a question for um, Ms. McArdle. All right. Since I since I kind of skipped to you before, go ahead with your question for Ms. McArdle. Right. I'm unable to raise my hand for some reason. Sorry. Right. Um, Ms. McArdle, two, just two questions. Um, um, what type of support of a non-Libertarian Party candidate do you think would be prohibited by the bylaws? One question. And um, as for the joint fundraising agreement, I'm assuming that – why is that being kept confidential – does it need to be? And is there any, any, any indemnification in that agreement of the Libertarian Party if there's any kind of problem with the FEC? And was the did the L, did the did the LNC um, run this by any legal counsel um, before entering into it? Those questions. I'll answer the ones I remember, and then can you prompt me on anything I miss? Um, we did run it by legal counsel. We ran it by in-house counsel. We ran it by our FEC preparation specialist. I ran it by three different individuals at the FEC. Their attorneys who work in their health department, they have 13 of them. And I call them uh, at least three times a week on various matters. Um, the Kennedy team ran it by their in-house counsel and they sent us uh, documentation. 
before with follow-up questions and afterwards. Okay. Um, what kind of support would I think was a violation of the bylaws? Yes. I think that um, an endorsement would definitely be against the bylaws. There's probably various other things, um, but definitely an endorsement. And does the does the agreement require any indemnification of the Libertarian Party uh, by the RFK campaign in case of a um, um, a problem from the FEC? Sort of. Uh, we have a policy to keep our contracts confidential, um, and that's why it hasn't been released um, for various reasons, legal liability and and negotiating. But essentially, the the bulk of the funds pay for anything that is an issue, if that makes sense, that becomes an issue. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go to Blay and then Rob. Um, hi. So a question for Mr. Jacobs. Um, I would like to know if, in his opinion, if the messaging presented by this agreement or the operation of this agreement were to blur the uh, distinction between, you know, it, it generally in, in the public between the Libertarian Party and the Kennedy campaign, um, or if it would uh, tend to uh, move public policy um, in a direction away from libertarianism, would that be, in your opinion, a violation of the bylaws? And I'd like to follow up with Ms. McArdle afterwards. Um, no, because the bylaws, as worded, don't deal with confusion. I don't think it would be confusing. But even if you could show confusion, it would not be a, it would not be a bylaw question. I've taken the position in writing that somebody who's going to get, be giving more than $3,300 to a candidate is probably going to know their political views or have some idea of that. Well, what, what would you say about the fact that Article 2.2 says that the um, policy, the purpose, one of the purposes of the of the Libertarian Party is to move public policy in a libertarian direction? You would say that... Um, that it is not a violation of the bylaws if the LNC were to make a decision that moved public policy away from a libertarian direction? Well, I, I think that the term would be vague, first of all, but let's assume that we would all agree that it does. I think you would be correct in that case. I'm not certain that if in this case, in the actual case before us, and not just a hypothetical, that would be the case. Uh, somebody going to the website. That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. What does it? That's, you know, one of the questions here is, does this move public policy away from a libertarian? Or would this move public in my, policy? If you're asking me, in my opinion, it would not. But that's a completely subjective opinion. But you agree that if it did, that would be in violation of the bylaws. Uh, and it was very clearly something that moved away, that moved policy away from a libertarian principle. Yes. I think it would have to and, be those two things. So, a similar question to the separate and distinct. If this, if this policy or this agreement, rather, this uh, which is the result of a decision of the LNC, um, were to blur the distinction generally between the Libertarian Party and the Robert Kennedy campaign, uh, would that be a violation of the of uh, Article Two Point One of the bylaws? That um, the the uh, the one of the goal one of the purposes of the party is to uh, to produce a party that is separate and distinct from all other political parties. I'm focusing on the distinct aspect of it. Um, at what point would a blurring of that distinction be um, uh, rendering the party not uh, fully distinct from all other? Or do you disagree that that it should that distinct means fully distinct? Can we be partially is 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 
some amount of distinction from another party sufficient, or does this require that we be fully distinct from other parties? Well, I think you have a contradictory bylaw, because in one spot you're saying you're supposed to move policy in a libertarian direction, and in, in this interpretation of the bylaw, you were saying, no, if we move it in that direction and it loses its distinctness, it's not good. Um, I think that if you can move it uh, in the direction of a libertarian policy, even if it loses some of its distinction, it would still be legitimate. The idea is to further libertarian policy. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, you. Well, to me, anyway. Um, um, do you uh, think that this? Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the with the fact of, of how this is operating, but um, maybe this is more for for McArdle, Ms. 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 McArdle. Um, I think it is. Uh, Madam Chair, do you do you believe that um, that this agreement uh, uh, in any way blurs the distinction or the operation of it blurs the distinction between the Libertarian Party and the um, and the uh, uh, Kennedy campaign? Um, and if so, do you think that that may be a problem for us? Um I do not, but I will say that I think that's a highly subjective question, blurred in whose eyes. There are a lot of people who have never heard of us. There are a lot of people who don't know what a libertarian is. There are people who think that Jill Stein was our presidential candidate in 2016. And so it's really going to depend who you talk to and how much they know about us, whether or not they perceive some association with 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 between to happen between us and Kennedy and what that means. Um one of the things that we've spoken with the campaign about is making sure that we continue to appear separate and distinct and that when they do social media messaging and anything like that, that they're not talking about us. You know, they had a tweet that people were uh, irritated by uh, recently. You know, we immediately went to them and was like, you know, if we're going to make this work, we can't have screw ups like that on social media. Like you've got to be completely separate and distinct from us, including in all of your messaging, even if you're trying to say something nice about us. Um, well, what, what do you think? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pause you right there. We need to remember that uh, we have limited time and uh, we want to try and get around to all the JC members who want to ask questions. Uh, also, Mr. Mr. Secretary, if you could pause the timer for a moment for another procedural matter. We still have uh, people with who are not completely identified in this Zoom meeting, Jeremy and Hector. Um I would like everybody in this uh, hearing to use their full names. You can adjust your name in the uh, settings inside your Zoom um, chat. Uh, so please, let's do that. And Blay, unless you had something else um, and that you can do briefly, I'd like to go to Rob. Well, yeah, I, thank you. The, the, the la I was going to let it go, but the, the, the last thing was just... What do you think the, the word distinct means in, in the bylaws? Do, do, do you think that it just is a, um, is a I don't know, a, a, a non-operative word or, um, you know, how, what does it mean for, for us to be distinct, in your opinion, from other parties? Running our own candidates, doing our own endorsements. There is actually a controversy in the state of New York where they have fusion voting. And I know that this has come up and it's been something that uh, I think the bylaws committee might have uh, talked about that, you know, not that they put put anything out, but it's it's been something that's been discussed in the past. But that's that's what I think. Separate and distinct. Your own your own candidate, your own endorsement. Uh, may I answer? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're running out of time and okay. I haven't gotten to Rob yet. So, Rob, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and might I ask you just if the person's in the middle of answering a question that we just let them answer the question if, if time runs. And then just also a reminder, we, we do think we might even have a, a half hour or 35 minutes at the end of this um, where we could possibly even continue these discussions. But um, we won't take them. OK. And, and so I'll throw this to either Chairman McArdle or Mr. Jacobs. So I will say that this committee and kind of trying to analyze this dispute has discussed something called the business judgment rule. 
basically, it says that you know organization's decision um, is kind of protected from second guessing. One exception to that would be self dealing by those who made the decision. So my my question is, I guess this is going to go to Chair McArdle. What assurances or protections are there that funds that are raised through this joint fundraising agreement? are not redirected to either expenses or to individuals that are not supportive of the party and or the national ticket. And and by the way, put put a pin in that one. And then the second question comes back to um, Chair McArdle said that an explicit endorsement by the LNC would be against the bylaws. And this is, I basically asked the same question to Secretary Harlos. What express language in the bylaws? And again, I'm looking at this, uh, I believe it's Article 5.4 says that the LNC is precluded from endorsing another candidate. Thank you. Um, what assurances can I give you? Well, there's there's monthly FEC reporting. So you see the way that we spend our money. Um, I hope that answers that question. We don't we don't have a way to to hide the money or squirrel it away or, or do something nefarious with it. Um, what express language in the bylaws says that the LNC is precluded from endorsing another candidate? Um, let's see. Might say something about our presidential candidates. I don't think so. 5.4 says affiliates can't do that. It doesn't say anything about the LNC. All right. Well, then maybe our uh, bylaws need to be revised. But if our affiliates are prohibited from, from doing it, you know. I think just a, a basic fiduciary duty is we should endorse our presidential candidate. Uh, Madam, Madam Chairman, if I can add one brief item. Sure. The bylaws do provide that the candidate shall be nominated at the convention. And I believe that that would preclude the LNC from doing something like nominating or uh, endorsing some other candidate at the uh you know at that level without going through the removal and vacancy process with which you all would be probably involved as well uh thank you and i'm sure that there are search sit particular situations where business judgment you know and the bylaws being silent on this would would come into play but i think those situations are few and far between i can't think of one off the top of my head unless you know heaven forbid our candidates are hit you know struck by lightning two days before the election and we can't reprint the ballots and we end up endorsing someone else. I, I don't think that any of those situations are, you know, ha are um, what we're experiencing right now. Ms. McArdle Fair also said, I believe Ms. McArdle, Ms. McArdle also said that the, uh, the distinct clause uh, implies that we must not support uh, candidates of other parties or movements. I'm sorry, the what clause? Separate and distinct clause, uh, Article 2. Okay. And, and Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair can I time. throw in, I know we're over time, but can I throw in one more question to Chair McArdle before we get to the next round? It's a follow-up on an answer she gave earlier. Is it something you could take a note on and ask her in the um, after yes. session? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, Mike, how are we doing on time? We are currently at the uh, five-minute rebuttals period, and we are 58 minutes into the meeting. Okay. So uh, on this session or on this section, uh, the respondent's time, we are slightly over. Is that correct? We started a couple minutes late. So we're actually, let's see, we started at... 505 central it is now 558 we've been in session for 53 minutes so we are a couple of minutes behind yes all right we still, um, have, plenty, we still have plenty of cushion right so i'm gonna i'm gonna um go to the next place on the agenda which is the um five minute rebuttals uh if you would please uh start your timer again for five minutes and um, since the petitioner started the earlier session, we're going to start with the respondent for her five-minute rebuttal. Angela, go ahead. Um, thank you. I don't have a full five minutes to give you. I, th I think that um, 
the petitioner has has made a lot of arguments. Obviously, I don't personally feel persuaded by them. I think that what speaks volumes is that there are people on the LNC yeah. who are saying that they give their full support to the candidates that we have. Um, you've heard me testify to the same and say that some of the money that we're raising is going directly to support them um, and that I am working directly to support them in as many ways as I can behind the scenes. A lot of that stuff is kind of a ugly behind the scenes stuff that I don't think is like, you know, it's not great necessarily to talk about how the sausage is made on a public call, but uh, rest assured we're doing what we can um, in this situation. We intend to give them our full support. We don't intend to endorse Kennedy. We intend to stay as separate and distinct as possible and happy to answer um, any questions later on in this hearing or, or afterwards. Thank you. All right. Do any of our JC members have any questions for Ms. McArdle from her related to her rebuttal? Uh, I think I saw Rob's hand go up first. So go ahead, Rob. No. Well, it's you added the part about related to the rebuttal. So no, this is the question I had from earlier. So okay. it's outside the scope of the rebuttal. So if All right. you want to so go to others. Yeah, we still have time for that uh, in the later, the last session. All right, go ahead, Stefan. You're muted. Uh, mine is not related to the rebuttal either. I can wait till later. All right. Any other JC members who have questions related to Ms. McArdle's rebuttal? But Stefan, you got your hand. Oh, your hand was up and now it's down. So you figured it out. He, well, he's in. Yeah. Uh, he did figure it out. Um, all right. Let's go to the petitioner for her five minute rebuttal. Mr. Secretary, if you could restart the timer for five minutes. Karen Ann. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to correct people who have been addressing me as National Secretary. I am a member merely in this. In this, um, The fiduciary duty issue was brought up. I think that should be weighing very heavily on the minds because fiduciary duty is balanced with the business judgment rule. But it was ironic that the chair agreed with me that the, um, that the same bylaw that prohibits uh, affiliates from nominating uh, partisan candidates from other parties does apply to the national party. I agree with her in, in that. Um, the, the fact that we might be out of money is an emotional argument. And I would ask the JC to consider why that might possibly be, but that may in fact be true. That does not cure a bylaws violation. Um, and Mr. Jacobs had said we had had, we have conflicting bylaws. Well, that is interesting because then it is upon the interpretive body, which is the judicial committee to resolve those conflicting bodies as uh, conflicting bylaws as much as can be determined in conjunction with the original intent. And we have 50 years of intent in this party. And I think that is very clear. And the original intent has to be interpreted in light with the statement of principles uh, has been like even David Nolan has said that multiple times. If you're uncomfortable with that as a yardstick, perhaps you should find a party that has a different yardstick. He'd said that multiple multiple, multiple times. And as to whether there shall be confusion, the joint fundraising committee is being advertised as a joint venture, as a nonpartisan one. And I know they allegedly corrected that, but that's already been put out in the public realm. They're directed to Kennedy um, 2024.com for uh, go to Kennedy 2024, uh, 24.com forward slash policies. And you'll see all the anti libertarian, even if you were going to do some kind of on the scale, which I don't believe in balancing rights, but even if you were to do some kind of utilitarian thing in that matter, he is all for growing the government. And remember that the chair has said, if the JC blesses this, she thinks we could then enter into one with Trump. And I don't think there's any question at all that he um, would grow the government, even if we might agree on one issue or another. That's why we're libertarians. We agree on certain things. And a libertarian direction is not unclear. It hasn't been unclear for 50 years in this party. To me, that is just absolutely ludicrous that that would even be brought up. And one last thing, the Oliver Termat campaign does not support a joint fundraising committee between the Libertarian National Committee and candidates other than Chase Oliver and Mike Termat. The delegates at the Libertarian National Convention chose Chase Oliver, not Robert F. Kennedy. This is from Steve Dasbach, the 
campaign manager for the for the Oliver Tremont campaign. Thank you, Ms. Harlos. Uh, judicial yes. committee members, are there any questions related to Ms. Harlos's uh, five minute rebuttal? Uh, Blay, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, um, I like to express first of all just a little bit of concern that uh, Ms. Harlos uh, is is telling us about the uh, the beliefs of the Kennedy campaign. That's really not. I don't see how how that, that's at issue here. What's at issue is what what the LNC is doing, not what the Kennedy campaign is doing. Um, but the question I would like to ask is, Ms. Carlos brought up uh, original intent. Um, how will could we determine what the original intent of the bylaws is? I can I can determine the, the what I think is the plain meaning of the bylaws, and I'm willing to you know of course listen to any arguments about what the plain meaning of the bylaws is. But as far as original intent is concerned, um, how how would we be able to determine that? I think you could determine that by the direction of the Libertarian Party for the past 50 years and the statements um, that have been made by the LNC over the years and the fact that we have never done anything like this before. And of course, that could be because we're just a bunch of Lusitarian autists, which is, you know, words that have been thrown about. But I don't think the original intent is difficult because the bylaws gives us the interpretive grid, which is the statement of principles. To say that it's not relevant what the Kennedy campaign is doing, I think that actually goes to your earlier question about whether or not this moves policy in a libertarian direction. It does not, since everywhere this joint fundraising committee is advertised as being a partnership with the Libertarian Party, LP.org is not put anywhere. Our platform is not put anywhere. Kennedy 2024 or excuse me, 24.com and like Kennedy Victory Fund is, which directs to their website. It definitely does advocate moving libertarian policy in other than a libertarian direction. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, how are, we, how are we doing on time? We are at time. Are we are at 90 minutes? Or just the five minutes for the rebuttal? Just five minutes for the rebuttal. We still have right. so, 24 minutes left. Okay, so we're now in the uh, in a twenty four minute cushion uh, for judicial committee members to ask whatever they, whatever else they wanted to ask, and I, I believe it was Stefan that said he had a, a limited time this afternoon. So I'm going to go to you first, Stefan. Can you please unmute? Okay, uh, Ms. McArdle, um, um does does the LNC have any plans to issue any? Press releases or statements making it clear that there is no endorsement or support or endorsement of, of the RFK campaign? Yes. Um, there's an email motion pending yes. right now. It has enough co-sponsors, but it hasn't actually been moved yet for us to vote on. Uh, but we'll we'll let that conclude and then that can, you know, will, that'll will basically it, be part of it. Will there be a press release? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um so what assurances do we have that the funds raised will be used or will they be used for the uh, Oliver campaign or is that just an intention or? I've it stated it publicly. I've stated it to the campaign. Uh, some of it, I can't, I can't get particularly granular with it on a public call like this, because I think there are people who would try to report us for coordinating beyond the expenditure limit to the FEC. Cause there are some people who are very angry um but i mean you'll you'll see it and then to the extent that coordination is legal and, and it is there's a there's a dollar limit that we can put into a written contract okay and one other question um is there any plan i, I understand we will uh, the the, L, the lnc will get donor data from the rfk donors will we will is there any plans to contact them or try to um to contact those donors that's another thing that I'm not really supposed to discuss in public, okay. but okay. you know we will have data. Okay, all right, um, Miss Miss Harlow, if I may, ask a couple questions for her, Miss um, Harlow, um, why do you believe it's contrary to libertarian principles for the Libertarian Party to help some American citizens overcome unlibertarian and unconstitutional FEC donation limits? 
because I, I actually didn't say that that wasn't moving libertarian policy um, in a different direction. I don't believe the FEC should exist. I don't believe the state should exist. However, the fact is we don't live in fantasy world. And the fact is that the Libertarian Party, our fiduciary duties is not to incur those types of rats. If I could push the button tomorrow and get rid of all of that, then they wouldn't need a joint fundraising agreement whatsoever. Um, advocating against that and advocating people to peacefully protest the law would actually be moving. But I actually don't believe, and Ms. McArdle hasn't given details here, there's been different stories given about how, if in fact we are allowing their candidates to circumvent FEC limits, that would make it illegal on the part of the LNC, okay. whether or okay. not I let's, agree with that all right, at let's, all. Let's stick to the, this question. Um, um, but do you think that it violates the rights of American citizens for the FEC to prevent them from donating a larger amount to to the campaign of their choice? Do you believe it violates their rights? As no. The you do no. not. OK. And then one other question. Um, so if you believe this this action of supporting uh, is an endorsement and is a violation of the bylaws, how can the LP cooperate with with? other parties or candidates uh, on ballot access initiatives and single issue coalitions. Why are those not a violation of the bylaws if this is? Because they are in fact single issue coalitions where we make it very clear that we agree on this one issue only. On this particular issue, we are raising money to get someone elected that is going to actively steal. We're not talking about even keeping the status quo. We're talking about additional theft a nationwide um, de uh, uh, daycare system, um, government backed 3% mortgages. We've seen how well that that's worked in the past. So that is the difference here. Single issue coalitions I'm all about. From what I understand, Mr. Kennedy is against the war in Ukraine. If we wanted to do some kind of single issue coalition with him against that, he's not against the one in Israel, but um, that might end up in Israel, but against the one in Ukraine, we, we walked with you know, leftists on, on the Capitol. I walked right next right. to Captain Thank Communist. You. Thank you. All right. Um, I think I saw Rob first, then Blay, then Ken. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Ms. Harlos, I'm just going to throw into the chat the term prefer preferatory materials canon. It's just a rule of interpreting statutes, I think it could be applied to interpreting bylaws. And I just want to throw that out um, for your consideration and, and, and thoughts. You don't need to answer it in this uh, hearing, maybe in something supplemental. But basically, the idea is, I can see where the argument might be made that the statement of principles is something prefatory and not specific, like bylaws that are further down. And, and so th those are not kind of the, the ones that are going to be restrictive in the way that bylaws further down. So I just, that that's an idea that I'm looking at as I try to interpret this dispute. And then then going to uh, Ms. McArdle, I want uh, to follow up on- Mr. Latham, though, like this is for questions and I would like to answer that question because I think you mischaracterized the statement of principles. Okay. Well, then I, if you want to answer it a little, I didn't want to hit you blind with a, a new term that you weren't familiar with and give you some time to think about it. Can you you want to come back yes. in a bit? And, no, I'm ready right now. now. I'm, I'd okay, like go, to right now. Go ahead. It's not, go ahead. It's not prefatory materials. It's actually in the bylaws further down. Article 3, Section 1, the statement of principles affirms that philosophy upon which the Libertarian Party is founded, by which it shall be sustained, and through which liberty shall prevail. So right there in the bylaws itself, we're not talking about like the Declaration of Independence, which wasn't, you know, incorporated in, it, right into the Constitution. The interpretive grid is right there into the bylaws. It is not mere prefatory material. Okay, thank you. And then back to Ms. McArdle. Um, you you had answered this question earlier that you said you'd ran this joint fundraising agreement by council and others. I didn't really get a specific response that running it by they gave their okay to it. And I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Maybe you're not available to say one way or the other, but I would want to give you the opportunity that the answers you got when you did consult with these various folks was that 
this was legal um, and is not going to subject the LNC to, you know, more more trouble than this thing is worth. Correct. Uh, that is correct. That's the answer that we got from our counsel, from the FEC attorneys, and also from the attorney retained by the Kennedy team who used to work at the FEC. We also went so far as to pass them all of Mr. Hagopian's questions, and they were answered line by line. So we have spent a good amount of time on it. We've also had multiple calls with our FEC um, expert as well. Uh, and to address any of her concerns, she had um, she had questions like about the nature of the agreement and basically just tips and advice and saying, you know, make sure that you follow the terms of your agreement, make sure everything with the agreement is in writing and, and you're following it closely. But she didn't say that it was illegal. And Mr. Chairman, if I can just do a quick follow up to that. So I, I've heard it represented or seen it represented that. The LNC is just asking, acting as this pass-through organization, and that there's nothing. Now, I've seen some other, uh, some of the amicus that have been filed to say no. The the LNC will have to sort through this stuff, and there will be some burden on the LNC. So, number one, is it your understanding that there would be some kind of compliance or sorting burden? And I, either way, does that then constitute? you know, something that's bylaws, bylaws violative, either, you know, not giving so full support or we're now supporting a competing candidate? Um, let me think about how to answer that. There's, there's like an additional amount of supervision to be done. But all of the payment for any any additional work that has to be done on quote unquote, our end is paid for out of the Kennedy Fund money. So it does not increase the workload of our paid staff with respect to our budget. Does that answer that? Yes, it does for me. Thank you. Okay. Although right. I'll just again, I'll note that in the chat, our, our former treasurer, Mr. Hagopian, has said that pass through organization violates uh, a CFR regulation. And, and that goes back just to my earlier comment. Without giving a legal opinion, I know a lot of administrative agencies write a lot of regs, and especially post Chevron, um, that are now suspect in yeah. terms of their constitutionality and enforceability. So I it will... makes it interesting to me as an attorney, um, you know. But uh, I, I just don't know how much uh, credence I give to that. And the fact that you've again gone to folks who said that this is uh, com compliant with the law is uh, somewhat assuring. Five attorneys. Uh are the uh, madam um angela i have a couple of questions of my actually one main question of my own uh are those attorneys named in any documents you're releasing to the general libertarian party membership Can you we had not discussed uh releasing the names of of all of the various attorneys that everyone knows that the party's attorney is is all over hall so I guess, you know, that name is out there. All right. Um, I'm Mr. going to, uh, Mr. Mr. Secretary, how are we doing on time now? 15 minutes. That was 15 minutes, you said? 13. 13 minutes. All right. Um, folks, keep your questions short and brief. And uh, respondents also keep your answers short and brief. Blake, go ahead. Muted. Blay, you're muted. I'm sorry. There are many parts of the bylaws that appear to be implicated here. Um, and I'd like to uh, get a brief answer, if possible, from Karen Ann on, on, on each of the four of them. And then I also have a very quick um, procedural question for Ms. McCardle. But um, uh, the the public policy clause. Uh, do you do you think that um, that the public policy? Do you, do you think that this agreement somehow moves public policy in a contra libertarian direction, or is intended uh, to move public policy in a contra contra libertarian direction? Do you have any uh, you know evidence of, of of either of that? 
again, I'm not going to get into intent, but I, I think you're truncating that bylaw it talks about electing libertarians to public office. Um, Mr. Kennedy might be a $25 um, a year dues payer, which I've no doubt that he is, but he's not running as the libertarian candidate. I would ask that we stop truncating um, that bylaw, but I'm not, I'm not going to speculate on intent. I think that's just inappropriate. I think everyone can read whatever. The, the bylaw says that, that the party is organized to implement and give voice to the principles embodied in the statement of principles by number two, electing libertarians to public office and to move public policy in a libertarian direction. My question There's is no about and. policy There's in no a libertarian and. There's no and. There's no and. Okay. All right. Um, the, uh, uh, the separate and distinct clause, uh, do you think that this, uh, agreement, uh, renders the party not, no longer separate or distinct, uh, from the, uh, uh, Kennedy campaign, or do you think that that's the intent to do so? I know you've said you, you don't want to get into intent, but I'm not going to get into intent because I don't think the bylaws do. It gets into effect. It does, in effect, do so, particularly by the fact that the LNC chair has specifically said we're not advertising this. Only Kennedy is, and he's using our name, our brand, and our goodwill to send people to his site, which definitely confuses people as to what we are as opposed to what he is, particularly when he described us, how wonderful it was that the nonpartisan Libertarian National Committee was in partnership with him. That is not separate and distinct. That is a partnership. All right. Mr. Secretary, what is our time? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. All right. I'm going to um, make a procedural comment here. I've uh, been watching the chat. There's some pretty nasty commentary in that chat. I would like everyone to please keep it nice and polite. Um, I forget what they call that in a, in a meeting setting, comedy or something like that. Uh, yeah. if, uh, if you can't maintain uh, control of your emotions in the chat, I'm going to ask that you be removed from it. Um, all right. Uh, Ken, I believe you had your hand up as well. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll be brief. My question is for Karen Ann. Uh, Mr. Jacobs talked about Roberts, and mm -hmm. please, I'm not going to remember the whole thing. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it again, about how the greater subsumes the lesser and the responsibility of the one is part of the other. And I think that's one of the key issues here. I, I know you're better with Roberts than I am. I'm going to go back and listen to what Mr. Jacobs said. I just wanted to know if you had any kind of a of an ex explanation. Do you agree with him? Do you disagree with him? Is, is I, I, I disagree with him, and I did say so in, in, in my brief, though I, I don't think it all hinges upon that. But I do think this is a cumulative case, but there's um, certain ones. So if you want to look at uh, 5668.6, a prohibition or limitation prohibits everything greater than what is prohibited or what goes beyond the limitation. So an endorsement is an endorsement, which is just mere words on paper. We know our state parties endorse people all the time and don't give them a single red dime because they don't have it to, to raise money for a candidate is I think is at the heart of it is um, specifically greater. And also it says when the author, when the bylaws authorize certain things specifically, other things of the same class are thereby prohibited. We are to give full support to our candidate. Full support would certainly include fundraising for them. The same class would be fundraising for a candidate that is not our nominee and thereby would be prohibited. And that is 56, um, 68 uh, subsection four. Okay, thank you. And just to be certain, I heard it said that both sides agree that the prohibition of 5.4 about supporting affiliates not being able to support other parties, I heard it said that that applies to LNC too. Both sides agree to that. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, I believe that that would be correct based on, I believe it's 14.1, that they could not endorse or nominate another candidate. Okay. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Ms. Arlos. Um, if there are any further FEC questions, and I hope there are, um, since I did name a proxy in the beginning, I would ask 
I would ask some uh, some of the same questions that were, and again, it's up to the JC that that were asked of Ms. McArdle to be asked of Mr. Hagopi, and I think that would only be fair because we've only heard that one is, side of this. That is that is that is your option. You may do that now if you wish. Um, it, I, I I would like Mr. Hagopian to answer some of the FEC questions that 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 were raised, since I am not capable of doing so. All right, Mr. Hagopian, um, Mike, if you share one you. moment, please. Yeah. Uh, one moment, please. We have six minutes left, and I do have a couple questions myself, but I can't raise my hand. <laughs> All right. Um, let's let uh, Todd speak, and as soon as he's done on that, I will call on you. Uh, I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try and go really fast here. Uh, first of all, it's been hinted that the FEC has nothing to do with the bylaws. It's not true. Article 6, Section 6 dictates that the treasurer has to follow, um, has to do external reporting. You cannot pass a motion that the treasurer cannot do legally. Article 9, Section 5 says that you cannot take a loan of over $2,000 without two thirds of the entire LNC approval. Both the chair and the RFK campaign have described this as we get the, the majority of the money and then use it per the contract to spend it a different way. That's a violation of the bylaws. So there are two violations of the bylaws based on the FEC. Um, 11 CFR uh, uh, 109-2 and 11 CFR 109-21 talk about coordinated contributions. JFCs are almost always considered to be coordinated contributions. If they are not, um, then section 109.10 is talks about the violation of limits. And basically what this says is you cannot do anything that we're talking about today. You cannot do things to get around the candidate contribution limits. You can't have backdoor deals. You can't have things that aren't in the contract. And and it's been hinted already that some things didn't make it into the contract, um, but are but and we can't talk about it in public. But we'll see it in the FEC reports. If that shows up in the FEC reports, you lose. If we get ninety percent, four million dollars, and we get four hundred thousand, that's great. If the FEC decides that we have to refund the four million dollars, the LNC is bankrupt. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Mike, and then Rob. Make them quick. I'll, I'll be quick. This is for Chair McArdle. On July 25th, you indicated to, to the LNC that the agreement was still being fine-tuned. What is the current status of the agreement? Has it been completely finalized? Um, the technical aspects of it have been completely finalized. We're working on an addendum that's in plain uh, language to make sure that that's something that we could share with um, the public. I hope that. I hope that makes sense. And also to make sure that it's something that all of our staff can understand when we when we circulate it. Okay, the follow-up then is, why did the, ex did the executive committee on July 11th vote to approve a contract they had not, that they hadn't seen and two weeks later wasn't even finalized? We talked about finalizing it uh, quickly because we were gonna lose the opportunity to get into that agreement. And we also wanted to quickly fundraise at uh, Freedom Fest and and make money off of that. But the the opportunity was, it was coming and going. All right, Mr. Seebeck, anything else? That's all. All right, I'm going to go to Rob and then Stefan. Go ahead, Three Rob. Minutes. And Mr. Chair, maybe I'd, I'd move. I see it's at 527. We did start a bit late. If I can move that, we extend this for another five minutes. I think we're going to, this is not a formal meeting as such, uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to make a chair's uh, prerogative to extend by 10 minutes. Uh, unless anyone on the EJC objects, let's go with that. All right, great. So thank you. So this is for uh, both the petitioner and the respondent. Um, so if, if both sides are saying the LNC cannot endorse candidates that are a member of the another party, then again, booking, looking to the specific bylaws language, as to this dispute, and again, this is for both, so I'd like to hear from uh, perhaps the petitioner first and then the respondent next, as to this dispute, how much weight should our judicial committee give to the fact that Mr. Kennedy is a member of the Libertarian Party? That's my question. Yeah, I'd like to answer that because this is something that's come up on bylaws multiple times and the bylaws committee in fact did put out something on this um, contrary to an earlier statement. Um, it, it, 
it says members of other parties. It doesn't say members of other parties and not members of the Libertarian Party. Mr. Kennedy has started multiple other parties and is members of those parties. It, and so, in fact, has many people who have run, say, Republicans in um, Colorado, they're also dues paying members of the Libertarian Party, but we're not allowed to endorse candidates of other parties. Many state party bylaws say that. Actually, I think I might have misstated the Colorado <clears throat> bylaws once, and I'm thinking um, of a different state. But the national bylaws just say member, not a member of another party, makes no mention of whether they are a Libertarian Party member or not. And it is without dispute that Mr. Kennedy is member of multiple other parties. And then Ms. McArdle, do you have any could, thoughts or, or yeah, Mr. Jacobs? Was, could, you, could you please um, repeat the question? Sure. So, so as to this dispute, how much weight should this committee give to the fact that Mr. Kennedy is a member of the Libertarian Party? And, and I'm speaking to this specific bylaws provision that says no affiliate party shall endorse any candidate who is a member of another party for public office in any partisan election? I think it's irrelevant because we're not endorsing him. Um, I'd, I'd also say that I don't want us to get so uh, tunnel visioned on member of another party that we were to skip over like the fact that our Massachusetts and New Mexico affiliates have different names. They're still part of the broader Libertarian Party, but they are not considered that um, technically according to their name, but, but I just think it's irrelevant. Okay. Thank you. All right. I believe Stefan was next. Yes. A uh, quick question for Ms. McArdle. Um, it, it, the agreement, um, whatever its status, uh, is it by its terms revocable? In other words, do we have an option to just exit it at will? And if not, if, if this committee were to decide that it was unauthorized, would there be contract breach liability or something like that from exiting an agreement that we had agreed to? I don't think there would be contract breach liability so long as we were able to close it in a way that didn't create compliance issues, which means not instantaneous, but it could take up to 48 hours or, or something of that nature. Does that make sense? I don't, I'm not following that. Um, I'm, okay. I'm asking if we say that the agreement, uh, you had no authority to enter into it, and what would happen if the LNC reported that to the RFK campaign and said, we can't do this deal with you? What would happen in terms of liability? W would it be a breach of contract? I don't think so. It's a, it's got it's got revocable pr provisions in the contract. The agreement does have a provision that allows either party to exit the, the, the agreement um, Yes. Upon, upon certain formalities and notice and things like that. Yes, exactly. So upon certain formalities and, and, and notice, and none of them are particularly onerous. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McArdle, in that question, you said something a little bit confusing. You were asked if there were any potential liabilities if we decided to exit the contract, uh, whether it's because of this JC or because uh, the candidate himself becomes unpalatable to the LNC or or whatever, for whatever reason. And your answer was that you didn't think so. Now, are there actual provisions governing how to get out of the contract at will? Um, yes. So let me think about how to phrase this. We would still need to take care of any FEC filings or anything like that that lingered after we closed out a contract because there are certain filing deadlines and requirements. So a lot of it would depend on, I, th I think what people requested us do, if it was just, you're gonna have to shut it down, then it can be shut down. But if it was like, shut it down immediately, don't touch anything, cease all operations, that, that would be a very different scenario. Does that, does that provide some clarity? <laughs> well, not having seen the provisions on uh, making a quick exit, I'm not sure. I understand that there would need to be time for, um, you know, various FEC reporting and and complying with regulations and shutting it down. Yes, that's that's. Uh, I think but that's all I'm really trying to convey. My worry is that um, uh, I, I, 
like I said, I would have to see the actual exit provisions before I could assess whether we're trapped in it forever or, well, you no. know, whatever. Yeah, we're not trapped in it forever by any means. Okay. Uh, if I could add, I would remind everyone that the motion authorizing this does specifically state that it will end under certain circumstances. So that are basically automatic. It would still might be the wind down phase, but that would be automatic as well. That was the way that the LNC agreed to it. All right. Any other JC members with any questions at this point? No, just Mr. Chairman, would you maybe just put out information on if people want to come back to this hearing and review it later, that it will be available. I don't know where it's going to live. You know, is it on the YouTube channel, the party's YouTube channel, or where will it people be able to find it? Um, I'm recording up in the shared folder. In the shared folder. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. 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 Secretary, will the uh, will the chat window be saved as well? It can be. Okay, I'd appreciate it if it were. All right. Um, unless any anyone has anything else, I'm going to call this to a close. Uh, any final comments? Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair, there was I, some another I hearing. Have, sorry, I did have my hand raised. I'm sorry, um, I didn't see it. Go ahead. No, the, and that that's okay. I, I I do object to this this tag teaming that's been going on because if I were permitted to do that, there are a few people I would have tag teamed in. But however, I will say that this appeal was filed before the contract was was even filed. So even whether there's a revocability clause or not, um, the chair entered into this in full knowledge that it could be declared void because this appeal was filed right away. All right, thank you. All right, uh, this will be, the recording of this will be um, in our shared Google folder, Google file folder. Um, and we will be announcing the location of that um, when we um, post the minutes of this hearing, if we have any. Uh, so without further ado, I think we're adjourned for now. Uh, Mr. Chair, there, there was some discussion uh, prior to the meeting about a follow-up uh, hearing. Do we want to talk about that or do we want to take that offline? We can uh, take that in a regular meeting. If we if we decide we need more information and want to hold another hearing, we can do that. But for now, we're going to take it offline. Do either of the litigants uh, feel the need for a further hearing? I do not. I think that would depend on if... Uh, and what uh, follow-up questions you could potentially have. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your um, your patience and indulgence. And um, you'll see something from us, uh, either a decision or a continuance uh, within the next couple of days. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy Toastmasters.